in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. This week, we are leading up, preparing for the reading on Sunday, which is actually the real first week of Lent. The week before was the week of preparation. This week is the first week. And in the first week of Lent, on Sunday, we're going to remember Jesus' temptations the three temptations on the mountain. Because, remember, we're fasting Lent. And what's really Lent? Is sharing with Jesus in His... in His... We share with Him in His... What does Jira in His... What did Jesus do? Huh? Fast. Thank you. So He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and the fasting was... actually, He experienced during the fast a temptation. Big, huge temptation. And you say, that's not nice, because we say to God and our Father, what do we say? When Lead God... us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. But then there's something very strange. The Gospels tell us, the real stories about Jesus tell us, that the Holy Spirit led Jesus to the wilderness to be tempted. That is, to me, Abuna is very confusing. How come, Philo, we say, lead us not into temptation, but the gospel says that the Holy Spirit led Jesus into temptation. Does that make sense? I don't think so. I don't think so. But there's something there that is a little bit difficult, not easy to understand. But today we read something very interesting, and I'm going to tell you how I understand this. Today, in the morning, before you came, because it was long, Uncle Mina read the, the, the story of David and Goliath. A story you all know, right? Right? David was a little boy. He was like a, maybe an early teenager. Maybe I would say 13, 14. And it was not a time for him to go to the army. All his brothers, the big guys, went to be soldiers. But David stayed behind to take care of the sheep because he was still little. And they didn't think his father never thought of him as a soldier. No one would look at him and think of him as a soldier. And he stayed behind to take care of the sheep. But before Goliath comes into the story, just a chapter before, God said to Samuel the prophet, I want a new king. Saul is no good. Saul is no good. So uh, Samuel said, but if I go there, that Saul would know and kill me. He said, just go, I'll be with you. And let's do that. You, you make a, a prayer and offer a sacrifice like a liturgy, and then I'll be with you there. So he went to Bethlehem, the house, the town where David grew up. And he went to Jesse and told Jesse, okay, I'm coming to make a liturgy in your house. We're going to offer a sacrifice. Bring your sons. So he brought all the sons. And he has daughters too. And brought all his family. But you know who is missing? David. David was out. Out. Was out in the, in the hills, in the fields, trying to take care of the sheep. So they can eat grass and run around. That's how sheep live. Then... He finished, and Samuel started looking at the sons of Jesse, because God told him it's going to be from that family. That man will give me a son for a king. So he looked at them. He saw the first one, whose name was uh, Eliab. And Eliab was a tall man, broad-shouldered, very muscular. He was a soldier. And he said to him, is this one, Lord? He said, no, 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 that's not the one. He brought the second one, who was tall and big and muscular. I said, is this this one? He said, no, not that one. And someone started to be wondering. He's running through the... There were six of them. He ran out of people in his house. So who is it, Lord? And the Lord said, the man looks to the eyes, but God looks to the heart. None of them is going to be good for a king. I have someone in mind. Then Samuel got a little bit confused. He said, we ran out of kids now. Where is this one? And he said to Jesse, is this all? He said, yeah, but you know what? 
almost forgot. There is a little one. I don't really remember him all the time, but he's taking care of the sheep out in the field. He said, bring him. She brought him. And as he came, he was the good looking. David was very good looking. As he came, Samuel saw him and the Lord said to Samuel in his heart, Samuel, this is the one. And he took him and took the oil. You know the oil that Abuna anoints you, but they had used to have a flask, like the one I get out. And it's a, like, like a big flask. And it was the holy oil, it's like my room. And then he took it all and dumped it on the head of David. And he said, blessed the anointed of the Lord. And he poured it and he just went down his... And that's it. And he left. Didn't say anything. Nobody said anything. Nothing happened. That's chapter 16 in 1 Samuel. Chapter 17. Next chapter. Immediately after that. A war started between the Philistines and the Israelites. You know that till today they have a fight. Right? Till now. It never stopped since then. So they're fighting together. But this time the Philistines found a giant. There used to be giants in the old times. And this was the last of them. The last of the giants. It was like a rare specimen. Something very weird. It was like a, you know, when, the, when you, you, have you seen a, a movie about fights with elephants? When people ride elephants and then just they can shoot their enemies from, that's, I think about him like that. He's like a war machine. He's huge, tall. The, the Bible might say, actually, he, he was as tall as the ceiling. So he looked down on the army like he's looking at ants, the army of Israel. It was very, very scary. And everybody looked up to him and said, well, how are we going to do that? <laughs> we don't have guns. There were no guns at the time. All what you have is a sword and arrows. And he has shields covering him so he cannot really pierce those shields with the arrows. So he stood there and the Bible says 40 days, every day from morning, from the sunrise. He would scream and give a long, ugly sermon to the, serve to the army of Israel. He scolded them. He roasted them. He barbecued them with words. And not only that, he said something not, not nice about God, their God. And now it became very, very scary. Because now he is actually challenging not only the people, but he's challenging the God of Israel. And God is not going to be okay about that. That's not going to end up well. So the father of Jesse, the father of uh, David, send, uh, said, David, you're the only son left, and I can send you on this mission. I'm going to prepare some food, because in those days, the armies did not have food. Families had to send food for their children in the, in the fight. He said, I'm going to prepare some food. You take it to your father, to your brothers. So he said, sure, dad, give it to me. And we remember Joseph, right? It's like Joseph. You have a child, you have one in, at home that can do the business of carrying food. So he carried the food to his brothers and he went there and he stood there and he was having the, I can imagine the basket or the bag of food and he's listening. And he's listening to this giant saying all these nasty things. What do you think David felt? Very angry. Very, very angry. Because he definitely loved God and he would not be standing still, letting someone who doesn't know God cuss in the name of God. So he was very angry, very unhappy. So uh, his brother saw him standing there listening and said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm here to bring food. That doesn't mean sound like it. You're just standing there listening to the man. Oh, I know your heart, his brother says. I know you. You're a proud kid who thinks he can do something, and I don't think you're going to succeed. Don't even think about it. He thought, oh, David uh, thinks he can go into the fight. He didn't think he's going to go fight Goliath, but he, he thought he would be a soldier. And then what? Then David said, I'm just standing. I'm just listening. I'm not doing anything. Then he goes to the head of the army, the chief, and he says to him, what will be done to the man who kills this giant? And the man said, the king promised his daughter in marriage, and he would give him a lot of riches. He said, here's the food. Take me to the king. He goes to the king, and the king said to him, what do you need, my son? He said, I'm going to kill that man. <laughs> and the, the, the king's soul looked at him. He was short. 
he looked uh, very nice looking, you know, like a girl more than a boy. And says, you're going to kill that man? How, my son? How, my son? How are you going to kill him? He said, don't worry, Lord King. I was taking care of the sheep. One day, a bear and a lion came trying to eat my sheep. And I killed both of them. God gave me the strength to do that. So I can do that to that man too. Okay, he said, even a child better than nobody, right? At least we can stop this man from calling us names. Even if he takes like a break for one day after he kills this boy. At least we have one day break. Fine. Give him the armor. A suit of armor for David. Imagine. He is like young, not very strong. And they put all this iron and metal on him. And David took the brace, the, the, the shield, and the breastplate, and the helmet, and the sword. And he could not even move his feet. Because it's too heavy. He was about to, he actually fell to the ground. I said, no, no, take it off. Take it off. I cannot do that. What are you going to do then? He said, I'll do it my way. So he went to the valley where the water actually runs in a little creek. And he picked small stones, very smooth. Five of them, thank you. Five stones, very good. He picked them. And he had a slingshot. What's a slingshot? It's a leather belt, a small, like a, like a leather strip, with a pouch in the center of it, like a little pocket. You see it? It's a leather strip with a little piece of leather that has a, a place to put a stone. When you fold it in two, and then you twirl it around like this, it gains momentum. It gets, gets uh, energy. You do it like this. I played with it when I was growing up in Upper Egypt. I played with, with it a couple of times. It's very difficult, though, to make a target, to hit a target. You do it like this, and then one of the ends of the sling you keep in your, your finger, and the other one you hold it with your thumb. But then when the time comes to let go of the stone, you let go of the, the piece in the, the thumb, and it gets opened, and the stone moves out of it as a bullet. It's really bad. If it's like a gun, but not as forcible as a gun. So when he kept twirling, 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 and he hit it, this is how it goes. It's very fast. And this is how you and kids in, 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 in Egypt learn how to hunt birds with it. They find a flying bird, they do it like this, and they throw it. And it, if they get enough training, they can get it. So, he went to the giant, and the giant, listen to this. The giant said to him, what? And this is all the best you can give me, Israel? That's your best? And he started to mock him and mock the king, who is a coward, who is sending him a child to fight and defend Israel. And he said, and then David had a, a staff. He has his pocket with the five stones, the bullets. And he has the slingshot and the staff. He said, what am I, a dog? You're coming me with, to me with a stick. You know what? Today I'm going to kill you and give your body to the birds to eat. And David, today, the Lord, will lock you in my hands. Pope Shunday used to say, well, how, how big is your hand, David? How big is your hand to take that giant in? Then he stood there and he said to him, listen to this. This is extremely important. I said, why it is linked to the story of Jesus. You come to me with a shield, with a sword, with a spear, but I come to you with the name of the Lord of hosts, the name of the Lord of the army, that you, that you disrespected. Saying I'm coming to the name of God that you disrespected, I mean beware, he's not going to be okay with that. And then the man started to... Um, to be, you know, laughing at him and jeering at him, stunned from aside, and he did this, this thing. And the stone got, when he released it, it uh, like very much zoomed in this spot right here, between his eyebrows, forehead. And then when this happened, he lost, he got a concussion. What we call a medicine concussion, but a severe one. A severe concussion usually ends up with, with unconsciousness person loses their balance, they get double vision, and they lose their consciousness. This is a small, a small stone can do that. That's true. David didn't waste time. 
he took his sword out. He doesn't have swords, remember? He didn't want to take any swords with him. He took the sword off, and it will be with David the rest of his life. He took the sword of Goliath and did what? I'm imagining, it's a huge sword by the way. If even to carry it by David is a big deal, to take it out and just hold it, and then put it on his neck and cut his neck and uh, give it, and then he actually, once he did that, the whole Philistines start running away. They couldn't stand. They were so terrified, they understood. This is no, no human strength. This is the work of God. So I would say the work of God actually in making this stone, imagine David going to fight for the first time in his life, wouldn't he be scared? I would be. But even with that, his hands didn't shake. God made sure that that stone came into the right place. Anyway, the key thing is, he said to the giant, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a shield, but I come to you with that's why when he came back after this, the people in the kingdom start rising and singing. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Because that's what he said to Goliath. I come to you in the name of... And it became the greeting giving to all the kings. All right, all right. Is there a Goliath today? Is there a Goliath that actually kind of uh, push you to um, be af afraid and to actually do things that you don't want to do? There is. There is a Goliath. All of us, we face him. And we cannot really challenge him. And that Goliath is, has a new name now. That's not God. That's a bad guy. The bad guy, Nofer. Not the good guy. Who is the bad guy that we're facing today that's pushing us to do all bad things? Yes. Thank you. It is the devil. And none of the human beings could actually face him or defeat him. And then he, the, his usual tricks always, to force us to do things that we're not supposed to do. To break our fast. To challenge our parents. And to, to butt our heads with people that were responsible for us. And to show off. These are all works of the devil. Who is the only person that really faced him and defeated him utterly? Yes? That's Jesus, right? Jesus, the son of God, who was born of St. Mary and had a human body like us and a spirit. And when did he start to defeat him for the first time? When is the first time that Jesus met the devil and actually had a fight and defeated him? Yes? When he was fasting, thank you, Nofer, you corrected yourself here. You, you understand this? The Holy Spirit, because remember how the oil, we get the Holy Spirit by the oil, led David to face Goliath and led Jesus to face the devil so he can be the, the king. Everybody in Israel actually said, David is the right king. Saul is no more a good king for us. Because he made the victory against our enemies in a way that's so godly, so miraculous. We can't really deny that David is the king. And Saul understood that and hated David from that moment on. Saul wanted to, he joined the devil. He said, I'm no more going to be peaceful with this boy. Yes, he did a country good job, but he hurt me. He's going to take my place. People will love him and put him as a king. Jesus did the same. So when the Holy Spirit sent Jesus to the wilderness to fight the, the, the devil, it was the Holy Spirit because he is our, Jesus is our king. Every time in the church we say, blessed is he, comes in. That means he had defeated our Goliath. How is Goliath working with you? I'll tell you. Whenever you have a tendency to break your fast or do a pleasure, anything that's pleasing to you, that is not godly. That's the first temptation. What is Jesus doing? He's praying. What is the devil saying? Look, look, this can be bread. Remember last Sunday in the church, we were talking about this in the, in the liturgy, and the people in the kitchen started cooking food, and the smell of it was stronger than incense, which is crazy. And all of a sudden in the church, everybody started abandoning prayer. We don't, we don't think about God anymore. We're thinking about food. There was a delicious kushari, in fact. But make it, being delicious, make it right. 
is the de when kush delicious kushari during the time of prayer. Is that right? No. Is kushari evil? No. Kushari is not evil, but being in the time of prayer, it is evil. That's what the devil is doing. That's how the devil works. While you're in the middle of prayer, your spirit is talking to God. The body says, oh, 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 stop this. Let's go and eat. That's who is doing that? The devil. Jesus actually said to him, man does not live by bread alone. I have a soul. I have a soul, devil. I have a soul. And that soul needs to feed too. For you to point out bread for me, it means you want my soul to die. And I want my soul to live. Because God wanted to live. We have time to feed my soul and I have time to feed my body. I cannot be doing all body and forget about my soul. The second one he says, I'll tell you something. How about you bow to me and I'll give you control over the whole world. And I'll tell you which temptation is that. When you butt heads with your parents, when you think of yourself as equal to them and you don't want to submit to them, because you think you're as good as them. The devil is tempting you and saying, you can take control. You are equally important. Are we as important as our parents? Think about that. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. You're a human being. You have the dignity of a human being. But in our status of life now, we need to do what? The word submit. To say yes to your parents. If they are not saying something evil. If they are saying something good, and it's not something pleasing to you, you say, okay, I'll let you do it. Because the devil is telling you, you can take charge, you can be in control, forget about them. They don't need to do that to you. That's a temptation by the devil. Who was submitting to his father and his mother? Jesus. Always said to St. Mary, yes, mama, I will do whatever you ask me to do. And he said to his father in heaven, yes, father, daddy, I'll do whatever you want. And the father said one time, I want you to go to the cross to save my people. They need a savior. And Jesus did say what? It is terrible, Father. It is terrible. It scares me so much. But you know what? Let it be your will, not mine. He conquered the devil for us to be the king. He needed to do that. Sometimes we need to remember that Jesus in the cross said to the Father, yes, although it was not pleasing at all. It was terrifying. In Gethsemane, he was sweating blood out of terror and anxiety and depression. Why did he do that? Because he had to say yes to his father. Do we get that far? Saying yes to our parents? I don't think so. I don't think so. That's how Jesus conquered our Goliath. Our Goliath. And that's why he is the king. Glory to him with his good father and the Holy Spirit. Now and forever.